This is one of a series of dialogues between J. Krishnamurti, David Bohm, Rupert Sheldrake, and John Hidley. The purpose of these discussions is to explore essential questions about the mind. What is psychological disorder, and what is required for fundamental psychological change? J. Krishnamurti is a religious philosopher, author, and educator who has written and given lectures on these subjects for many years. He has founded elementary and secondary schools in the United States, England, and India. David Bohm is professor of theoretical physics at Birkbeck College, London University in England. He has written numerous books concerning theoretical physics and the nature of consciousness. Professor Bohm and Mr. Krishnamurti have held previous dialogues on many subjects. Rupert Sheldrake is a biologist whose recently published book proposes that learning in some members of a species affects the species as a whole. Dr. Sheldrake is presently consulting plant physiologist to the International Crops Research Institute in Hyderabad, India. John Hidley is a psychiatrist in private practice who has been associated with the Krishnamurti School in Ojai, California for the past six years. In the first dialogue, the nature of the self was discussed, its relationship to suffering, to society, and to religion. Questions raised were, can one discover or learn about these relationships, and is the need for psychological security the root of the problem? Today's discussion continues with these questions. We talked yesterday, we started with the question of uh, the origin and nature of psychological disorder. And uh, it was suggested that the, it has its roots in self-centered activity, which is divisive and conflictual in nature. And that biologically, such factors as instinctual aggression and dominance drives, the facts of illness and death, all contribute. I wondered if we could start this morning, David, by having you comment on the relationship between uh, these biological factors and uh, psychological security. Yes, well, uh, biologically, if you begin with the animal, uh, you have all sorts of uh, things like fear and anger and aggression. And they're fairly simple. They exist for a short period while the, while the fact is there, and then they generally disappear. Uh, leaving little trace. Uh, there may be a few cases in the higher animals where there's some memory, but it's in man that the memory becomes very significant. Uh, uh, remembering all these experiences and anticipating the future, you get a very different sort mm -hmm. of behavior. For example, uh, <clears throat> with an animal, you might have a bad experience with another animal, and shortly afterward, he'll be in a fairly good state of equilibrium. But say we have a, a quarrel between two groups as in Northern and Southern Ireland. This has been gone on for 350 years and there's a specific effort to remember it which you can see going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think this is the biggest difference now. The memory being the biggest yeah, difference. Yeah, the effect of memory, the, the consequences of memory. See, memory by itself would obviously not cause any trouble because it's only a fact, right? But yes. memory has consequences. It Meaning. may produce fear. You see, it may produce anger. Uh, it may produce all sorts of disturbances to remember what did happen and to anticipate what may happen. You mean thinking about it? Yes, mm. based on memory. Right? Mm. I mean, obviously, the animal that's been attacked by another animal remembers in the sense that when it sees the other animal again, it's afraid. Yeah. But probably doesn't think about it in between. Yes, it can't form an image. You see, I, I don't believe that most animals can form images of the other animals, and mm. I can base that on experience that I have seen dogs fighting very hard, and as soon as you turn the corner, the dog sort of forgets what happened. Mm. <laughs> he, he's disturbed, but he doesn't know why he's disturbed, you see. Mm. Now, if he could remember it, the other dog, after he turned the corner, he could continue the struggle over territory <laughs> mm. indefinitely. So. The point about territory is the animal maintains it in a certain limited context, mm -hmm. but man remembers it and he maintains this territory indefinitely and wants to extend it and, and so on because of his thinking about it. So, okay. uh, mm, sorry. <coughs> no, please, please. Oh. So, are you suggesting that the basis of 
um, the specifically human kind of pain mm -hmm. and suffering over and above the kind of suffering we see in the animal kingdom is this ability to remember, to brood over, to think about these... Yes, uh, to, the problems. animal may have some of that. I, I've seen examples on television of a, a deer who lost its doe and it was pining away hmm. in the wild. But uh, I think it's limited. That is, there's some suffering of that kind in the animal world, but with man it's enormously expanded. You know, hmm. it seems limitless. Yes, I think the major point is that with man, the thing can build up like a tremendous explosion that fills his whole mind, you see, and hmm. it can become the major motive in life, you see, to remember the insult and to, uh, you know, to revenge the vendetta of families over many <coughs> generations. Hmm. And to remember the bad experience you've had with somebody and to be frightened of what's coming back like at the examination that the child may be frightened of or something like that. But have you answered his question, sir? Which is? Which was? How, how does the uh, biological fact of illness or hmm. death or instinctual drive result in a psychological problem or disorder? Oh, by thinking about it, I say that uh, uh, the, the biological fact is not a serious problem. Uh, in the long run, but as soon as you begin to think about it, and not merely think about it, but make images about it along with that thought, you know, uh, and to revive the memory and anticipate the feeling of the future, and while you are thinking, then it becomes a very serious problem because you can't stop it, you see. You will never attain security by thinking about it. <laughs> but you're constantly seeking security by... See, the purpose of thinking is to give you security in, in practical affairs, you know, yes. technical affairs. Now, therefore, you're doing a similar sort of thinking, saying, how can I be secure against the uh, uh, possibility of suffering again? And now that... Uh, there's no way to do that. You may take technical steps to make it unlikely, but... Uh, as you think about it, you uh, begin to stir up the whole system and distort the whole mental process. Well, it seems clear that by thinking about it, we stir up the emotions and the, the uh, associations that, go, that are those thoughts. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're not suggesting we shouldn't think about it, are we? Well, it depends or... on how you think about it. You see that this thinking is, uh, gets to be directed toward giving you and a sense of security, you see, a, an image of security. Right, I get hurt yeah. when I'm little or sometime along the line and it uh, creates a fear in me and I anticipate that kind of situation. I may not even remember the incident, yeah. but I want to avoid it in the future. Yes, and now the point is that the mind is always searching for how to avoid it mm -hmm. and searching out thoughts, images, I was saying, that fellow is the one who did it, I must keep away from him. You know, coming to conclusions, and uh, if any conclusion gives you an image of security, then the mind gr uh, holds on to it, right? Uh, without actually any basis. Could you elaborate on that a little? Well, if you've had, you know, see, uh, if you've had a bad experience with somebody, you may conclude that you should never uh, trust him again, for example. Well, that might be quite wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, the mind is so anxious to have security that it will jump to the conclusion that it's not safe to trust him. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, if you find somebody else who seems to treat you well and uh, reassures you and flatters you, then it may jump to the conclusion you can completely trust him. Mm -hmm. Now, the mind is now looking for thoughts that will give it good feelings, you see, because the feelings of the memory are so disturbing to the whole system that the mind, its first function is to make the mind feel better rather than find out what is the fact. Okay, so we're saying that at this point the mind isn't interested in what's true, it's interested in getting secure. Yeah, it's, it's so disturbed that it wants to come to order first, you see, and it's adopting a wrong way as I see it. The wrong way being? To think about it and try to find thoughts that will make it feel better. So you're saying the thoughts themselves are taking the, in some sense, taking the place of reality, that it's trying to get thoughts, a person is trying to get certain thoughts in his head that make him feel better. 
Yeah. And that's self-deception, you see. But what makes you think that the primary drive is for security? Oh, we discussed that yesterday, of course, but... Uh, uh, well, I wouldn't be sure that's the only primary drive, but it's obviously, for the animal, uh, mm. it's a very important drive to want security, right? Mm. We also want pleasure, I think that's another drive, which are closely related. But to, to come back to this question of security, in its limited forms, security is clearly one goal that we have. I mean, people like to have houses and have them secure and cars and possessions and bank balances and that kind of thing. But there's this uh, factor that comes in when you've got that. There are two things that actually that come in. One is maybe the fear that you lose it, but the other is boredom with the whole thing and the craving for excitement and thrill. And this doesn't seem to fit within this model of this primary and central craving for security. Well, I, and that's why I said there's, that's only one of the drives, right? Mm. That uh, there's also the drive toward pleasure, as an example, and much of what you said is included in the drive toward pleasure, right? Well, I'm I not mean, so excitement sure. excitement is pleasurable. I mean, people hope for pleasure and excitement rather than pain, uh, or as a rule. But don't you think there's a pleasure in itself in curiosity and there's a sense of freedom and discovery that uh, you can get from certain kinds of exploration, which is neither just straightforward pleasure, yeah. it's not a repetitive kind of pleasure, mm -hmm. nor is it security. Yes, well, I didn't want to say that all our drives are caught in this thing. You see, I, I said that by, if you th think about them and base them on memory, then they're going to get caught in this problem. Mm. Now, there may be a natural uh, free uh, interest in things, mm. which could be enjoyable, Mm. And that need not be a problem, right? But mm. if you were to become dependent on it and think about it and say, I, if I don't have it, I become very unhappy, then it would be a similar problem. Mm. But could we go into the question, what is security? What does that word convey? Apart from uh, physical security. I would have said invulnerability. Not to be hurt. Not to be hurt at all. Not to be able to be hurt. Not to be able to be hurt mm. and not to hurt. Physically, we are all hurt. Some one way or another. Yeah. Operations, illness and so on and so on. When you talk about being hurt, are you talking about psychological hurts? Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how it is that uh, when a person comes into my office, he's, he's, his complaint is his psychological hurts. And How do you deal with it? I try Suppose and... I come to you, I'm hurt from childhood. Yeah. I'm hurt by the parents, school, college, university. Yes. When I get married, I'm, she says something, I'm hurt. Yes. So this whole living process seems to be a series of hurts. It seems to build up a structure of self that is hurt yes. and, a, and a perception of reality that is inflicting yeah. hurt. Now, how do you deal with it? I try to help you see that that's... Uh, I try to ha help you see how you're doing it. What do you mean, how do you... Well, for example, if you um, have built up in you the, the notion that you're uh, one down, um, or that you're the victim, then you perceive yourself to be victimized and you perceive the world to be a victimizer. And I help you realize that that's what you're doing. But. By showing that, showing me that, will I get rid of my hurt? My hurts, very deep, unconscious you know, hurts that have make me do all kinds of peculiar actions, mm -hmm. neurotic. Mm -hmm. Well, if you don't just Iso isolating myself. Yes. It appears that people get better that they realize that they are doing it. And in some local area, it seems to help. No, but well, aren't you concerned, if I may ask, 
with not being able to hurt at all. Uh, yes. What do you mean by that? Not hurting somebody else or not hurting, but right. not being hurt and inside of you? No, I may hurt others unconsciously, mm -hmm. unwillingly, but I wouldn't hurt voluntarily somebody. Yeah, you really don't intend to hurt yeah. anybody. Yeah, I wouldn't. Well, maybe not, but I don't see the connection between not hurting other people and not being hurt oneself. At least I'm sure there must be one, but it's not obvious. And most people's view of the best way not to be hurt would be to be in such a position that you, you can hurt others so much <laughs> they'd never dare. And this is the principle of <laughs> nuclear retaliation. I mean, so, this is a very common principle. Yes, of course. And so it's not obvious that not hurting others is related to not being hurt oneself. In fact, usually it's taken to be the reverse. It's usually assumed that if you're in a position to hurt others very much, you'll be very secure. Of course, I mean, if you're a king or a sannyasi or one yes. of those people who have built a wall around themselves, yes. naturally you could never hurt them. Yes. But when they were children, they were hurt. Yes. That hurt remains. Mm. It, it may remain superficially or in the deep recesses of one's own mind. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you, as a psychologist, psychotherapist, or help another who is deeply hurt and is unaware of it, and to see if it is possible not to be hurt at all? I don't address the question about, is it possible to not be hurt at all? That doesn't come up. Why? Wouldn't that... Wouldn't that be a reasonable question? Well, it seems to be what we're asking here. It's an, it, is a, it, it is the essence of the question that we're asking. We ask it in terms of particulars only in therapy. And you're asking it more generally. Is it possible to end this hurt, period? Not just a particular hurt that I happen to have. So how, do, how should we proceed? Well, it would seem that the structure that makes hurt possible is what we have to get at. What makes hurt possible in the first place? Not this hurt or that hurt. What well, I think that's fairly simple. Why am I hurt? Because you say something to me which is not pleasant. Well, why should that hurt you? Because I have an image about myself as being a great man. You come along and tell me, don't be an ass, <laughs> uh -huh. and I get hurt. What is it that's being hurt there? There, the image which I have about myself. I'm a great cook, mm -hmm. a great scientist, a great carpenter, whatever you will. I've got that picture in, in myself, and you come along and put a pin into it. Mm -hmm. And that gets hurt. Mm -hmm. The image gets hurt. The image is me. Uh. Well, I feel you know, that will not be terribly clear to many people. I mean, how can I be an image? You see, many people will ask. You see, how can an image get hurt? Because if an image is nothing at all, why does it hurt? Because I've been invested into the, in that image a lot of feeling. Yes. A lot of uh, ideas, emotions, reactions. They're all that is me. That's my image. It doesn't look like an image to me, though. It looks like something real. Ah, that, that of course, mm -hmm. for most people, is very real. Yeah. But that is me. The reality of that image is me. Yes. Well, can we get clear that it's an image and not real? Image is never real. Symbol is never real. You're saying that I'm just a symbol? Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big step. From that arises the question whether it's possible not to have images at all. Well, wait a minute. I don't think we've clearly established that, uh, that I am an image. Ah, let's go into it. I, I mean, it's not entirely clear. I mean, it's obvious that, that to some extent one is an image, that one, I, I have a feeling about myself and so on. It's not entirely clear that this is entirely unjustified. 
You see, certain aspects of it may be exaggerated, certain aspects may be unrealistic. But, you see, one approach would be, well, we've got to remove, shave off these unrealistic aspects, pare it down to a sort of reasonable size, and then that which remains would be the real thing. So, so are you raising the question, what am I? Well, I suppose so, yes. Yes, basically. <laughs> <laughs> what are you? Mm. What is each one of us? Mm -hmm. What is a human being? Mm -hmm. That's a question that involves it. Yes, it seems unavoidable. In a boy, yes. Mm. What am I? Mm -hmm. I am the form, the physical form, mm -hmm. the name, the result of all education. Mm -hmm. Your experience. My experiences, my belief. My ideals, principles, the incidents that have marked my, marked me. The structures you've built up that are how you function, yeah. your skills. My fears, my activities, whether they are limited or mm -hmm. my so-called affection, mm -hmm. my gods, my country, mm -hmm. my, ling my language, fears, pleasures, suffering, all that's me. Yes. That's my consciousness. Mm. And your unconscious. Unconscious. That, I mean, that's my whole content of me. Okay. But there's still that feeling of actuality that me is there. You see, uh, I mean, you may say it, uh, you could reasonably argue that that's all there is to me, but when something happens, there's the feeling of its actual presence right, at that moment. I don't quite follow well, you that. See, uh, if somebody reacts to being hurt or angry, he feels at that moment there, that there's more than that, you see, that, is the, the, that, that there's something uh, deep inside which has been hurt, right? I don't quite see what is... Uh, my image can be <coughs> such a deep... Uh, that's my image at all levels. Yes, you, so I have an image about myself, yeah. suppose, mm -hmm. that I'm a great poet, or a great painter, or a great writer. Apart from that image, as a writer, I have other images about myself. I have an image about my wife, and she has an image about me. I, there are so many images I've built around myself. And the image about myself also. Yes. So I'm a, a bundle of images. Yes, I understand. Partial. Yes, I, that you're saying that there's nothing but this bundle of images. Of course. But this will. You know, the question is, how are we to see this as an actual fact? You see, that is. I, the, uh, but wait a minute. There is something but this bundle of images. I mean, I'm sitting right here now, seeing you and all the rest of it. Now. There's, I have the feeling that there's a center of action or center of consciousness which is within my body and associated with it, which has a center, and it's not you, and it's not you, it's not David, it's me. And associated with this center of action, my body, sitting here, is a whole lot of memories and experiences. And without those memories, I wouldn't be able to speak, to talk, to course, recognize anything, and so on. So. <clears throat> There seems to be some substance to this uh, image of myself. I mean, there may be false images associated with it, but there seems to be a reality which I feel as I sit here. So, so it's you, not entirely. Are illusory. you saying that you are totally, basically different from the three of us? Well, I'm in a different place, and I have a different body. Of course, and in that I, sense, I'm different. Of course, I admit that. I mean, I mean, you're tall, I'm short, or I'm brown, you're yes. black, or you're white, or you're sub pink, or whatever it is. Now, at another level, I'm not basically different in the sense that we can all speak the same language and communicate, so there's something in common. Yes. And at a purely physical level, all of us have a lot in common with each other, the same kinds of enzymes, chemicals, and so on. And those, indeed, hydrogen atoms, oxygen like, atoms, we have in common with everything else. Yeah. Now, is your consciousness different from the rest? Conscious, not bodily responses, bodily reactions, bodily mm, conditioning. 
is your consciousness, that the, your beliefs, your fears, your anxieties, depressions, faith, all that? Well, I would say that many of the contents of my consciousness, or many of the beliefs, desires, etc., I have, other people also have. But I would say the particular combination of experiences, memories, desires, etc., I have are unique, because I've had a particular set of experiences, as you have and as everyone has, which makes a unique combination of these different elements. So, so is mine unique? Yes. So is yours? Exactly. But the uniqueness makes it all common. It's no longer unique. That's a paradox. <laughs> it's um, mm. not immediately clear. Mm. Why isn't it clear? I mean, everybody's unique, right? Yes, we're all unique. I question that. But we're not unique in the same way. I question Otherwise, the word unique becomes meaningless. What? Otherwise, the life well, has If no we're meaning. unique, each of us is unique, we have a unique set of experiences, environmental factors, memories, etc. That's what you just now said. That's common a lot to all of us. Yes, we all have it. But what we have is different. Yes, you brought up in England. Yes. And perhaps another brought up in America, mm. another brought up in Chile. Mm. We all have different experiences. Yes. Different uh, country, different views, different mountains and so on. Yes. But apart from the physical environment, linguistic differences mm. and accidents of experience, mm. but Basically, fundamentally, deep down, we suffer. Mm. We are frightened to death. Mm. We are anxious, we are agonizing about something or other. Mm. And conflict, that's, com that's the ground on which we all stand. But that doesn't seem a very startling conclusion. No, it is not. But I that's think, I say that uh, what you're saying really is, implies that we're, what we have in common is essential. And uh, fundamental rather than just uh, superficial. Uh, superficial. You see, now I've talked with people about this, and they say, everybody agrees we all have these things in common, but sorrow, uh, suffering, and so on are not so important. The really important point are the higher achievements of culture and things like that, as an example. Maybe the, the distinction is between the form and the content. Our contents are all different, and they have similarities and differences, but maybe the form is the same, the structure. I would say content are the same for all human beings. But, you see, I can recognize that there's such a thing as common humanity, but I would regard that as quite possibly an abstraction or a projection rather than a reality. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How do I know that's not an abstraction? Because you go around the world, mm. you see people suffer, mm. you, peoples, you see human beings in agony, Mm. Despair, depression, mm. loneliness, mm. lack of affection, mm. lack of care, attention. That's, that's the basic human reactions, basic human... That's part of our consciousness. Yes. So you are not basically different from me. You may, you, you're tall, you may be born in England, I may be born in, in Africa with dark skin, mm. but deep down the river, mm. the content of the water, mm. of the river is the water. The, wa the river is mm. not Asiatic river or European river, it's mm. a river. Yes, well, that's clearly true at some level, but I'm not quite sure at what level, you see. I'm talking basically, deeply. But you see, it seems to me, why stop there? That I can see something in common with all other human beings, but I can also, by looking at animals, see something in common with them. We have yes. a great deal in common surely, with the animals. Surely, surely. So why stop at human beings? I why don't, not, why I not don't, say... Because I say I'm... If I feel, <clears throat> I don't like the word common, that mm. sounds, it's, uh, one feels that is the ground on which all human beings stand. Mm. Their relationship with nature, animals and so on. Mm. 
and that the content of our consciousness is, again, the ground of humanity. Love is not English, American or Indian. Hmm. Hate is not. Hmm. Agony is not yours or mine. Agony. Hmm. But we identify ourselves with agony. It's my agony, which is not yours. We might go through it in very different ways, though. It's... Uh, yeah. Different expressions, different reactions, but it basically it's agony. Hmm. Not German agony and Asiatic agony. It's not what is happening, British and Argentine. It's human conflict. Why do we separate ourselves from all this? The British, the Argentine, the Jew, the Arab, the Hindu, the Muslim, you follow? Mm. Which all seems so nonsensical, tribal. The worship of a nation is tribalism. Mm. So why can't we wipe out all that? <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. Why can't we? <laughs> because, again, we'll come back to the question. I identify with my nation because that gives me a certain strength, certain standards, certain status, certain security. When I say I'm a British, oof, Mm. So, this division is one of the reasons of war. Mm. Not only economic, social, and all the rest, but mm. nationalism, which is really glorified tri tribalism, is cause of war. Why can't we wipe that out? Seems so reasonable. It seems reasonable on a level like nationalism, people don't uh, think they're England. Start from there. Okay. But then I have a patient, and he does think that he's married. And he's that it's, American. And that, that he's married, and that it's his wife. Yes. And that... Of course it's his wife. Well, so isn't what? that the same action that you're talking no, about? No, no. So, just let's go into slowly. Okay. Why do I want to identify myself with something greater? Because I'm not like sufficient. Like nationalism, like God. I don't feel sufficient. Which means what? Insecure, Insecure, anxious. insufficient. Yes. Lonely. Yes. Uh, isolated. Uh -huh. I've, I've built a wall around myself. Yeah. So all this is making me desperately lonely. And in, out of that conscious or unconscious loneliness, I identify with God, with nation, with uh, Mussolini, it doesn't matter, Hitler or uh, any religious teacher. OK, or I get married, I have a job, I make a place for myself. Yes. And that's all also identification. Why do we want to identify with something? No, basic question is to why do we want roots? To belong. To belong. Mm -hmm. Which is also implied to become. Yes. So this whole process of becoming. From childhood, I'm asked to become. From the priest to the bishop, bishop to the cardinal, cardinal to the pope. Mm -hmm. In the business world, it is the same. Mm -hmm. In the spiritual world, it is the same. I am this, but I must become that. Okay, what now, I am is not this? sufficient. Why do we want to become? What is to? What is it that's becoming? I don't. Sorry. Well. <clears throat> And the obvious reason for wanting to become is a feeling of insufficiency, inadequacy in the state that we are. And one of the reasons for this is that 
we live in, in an imperfect world. Our relations with other people are imperfect. Um, <clears throat> we're not content for a variety of reasons with the way we are. So the way out of that seems to be to become something else. Yeah, well, so why not? You see, that means escaping from what is. Yes, but it may seem that what is is something we have a need to escape from. Because there's something so wrong with it. So why not? Uh, all right, take the usual experience. I'm violent. And I, I have invented non-violence. Mm. Right? And I'm trying to become that. Mm. Mm. And it'll, I'll take years to become that. Mm. In the meantime, I'm violent. Mm. So I've never escaped from violence. Just an invention. Well, you're trying to escape from it. <laughs> you may escape in the end. No, I don't want to escape. I want to understand the nature of violence, what's implied in it, whether it's possible to live a life without any sense of violence. But what you're suggesting is a more effective method of escaping. You're not suggesting an abandoning of the idea of escaping. You're I suggesting have... that the normal way of escaping, trying to become non-violent, is one way of doing it which doesn't work. Whereas if you do another method where you actually look at the violence in a different way, you can I'm become not non-violent. Well, you're changing then. No, I am one I am violent. Yes. I want to see what's the nature of violence. How it arises. But for what purpose? To see whether it's possible to be free of it completely. But isn't that a kind of escape no. from it? Being free of something. It's not an escape. Why not? Avoidance, uh, running away, fly away from what is, is an escape. But to say, look, this is what I am, let's, let's look at it. Let's observe what it, its content is. That's not escape. Oh, I see. The distinction you're making is that if you run away, an escape in the normal sense is running away from something, like escaping from prison or one's yes, parents yes, or whatever. Yes. But they still remain there. What you're saying is that to escape, rather than escaping from violence, which leaves violence intact and still there, and you try and distance yourself from it, you try to dissolve violence That's or it. abolish it. Yeah. Dissolve. Yes. Not abolish it, dissolve. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this is different from escape because uh, you're trying to dissolve the thing rather than run away from it. Yeah. Yes. So running away is... So everybody runs away. Well, it usually works, to a limited extent. Oh. Yeah, no, it does, it <coughs> it's like running away from my agony by going to football. I come back home, it's there. Mm. I don't mm. want to go to watch football, but I want to see what, I have, what it, violence is and see if it is possible to completely be free of it. Mm. If I'm in a very unpleasant society, and uh, I can escape from it by defecting or leaving it and going to another one. And to, this does, in fact, mean that I escape to some I... extent. Um, <clears throat> so these are always partial answers, and they're partially effective. But, but I don't want partially violent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm partially free from it. I want to find out if it's possible to be totally ended. That's not an escape. That's getting and putting my teeth into it. Yes. But you have to believe it's possible in order to put your teeth into it. I don't know. I'm going it. to investigate. I said, for me, I, I know what I, one can live without violence. Mm. But that may be a freak, that may be a biological mm. freak and so on. But to, to, to discuss together, four of us, and see if we could be free of violence completely, means not escaping, not suppressing, not transcending it, mm -hmm. and see what is violence. Mm -hmm. Violence is part of imitation, conformity. Right? Mm -hmm. Part is physical, uh, that I'm not talking mm -hmm. about. So, psychologically, there's this constant comparing. That's part of hurt, mm -hmm. part of violence. Mm -hmm. So, can I live without comparison? When from childhood I've been trained to compare. Mm -hmm. 
make sure with somebody. Mm -hmm. I'm, tra I'm talking comparison, not good cloth and bad cloth. Right. Mm. Talking about comparing myself. Myself. Mm -hmm. With you who are bright, who are clever, who have got publicity, who got... Mm -hmm. When you say a word, the whole world listens, mm -hmm. and I can shout, nobody cares. Mm -hmm. So I want to be like you. Mm -hmm. So I'm comparing constantly with my, myself with something I think is greater. So this is where becoming comes from, yes. this comparison. That's just it. Mm -hmm. So can I live without comparison? And doesn't that leave me in the insufficient state? No. To live without comparison? Yes. No. Well, here I start off then insufficient. I, uh, you understand, sir? Am I dull because I compare myself with you? Yes. Well, right? Yes, you're dull because you compare yourself. If I, I by comparing myself with you, uh -huh. who are bright, who are clever, I become dull. I think I'm dull. Yes. But if I don't compare, then it I am what I am. Well, you may not compare, but I may compare. I may say you're dull. All right. I then, say all right. You say you're dull. I say am I? I want to know what does it mean. Does it mean he's comparing himself <laughs> with me, who is, you follow? See, the yes, reverse of it. It would be very frustrating, that. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if one compared oneself with somebody and said, you're dull. Mm. Yes. And then they said, what does dullness mean? <laughs> <laughs> yes. The other day, after one of the talks in England, a man came up to me and said, sir, you are a beautiful old man, but you are stuck in a rut. Mm. I said, I said, perhaps I don't know, we'll go into it. So I went up to my room and said, am I? Mm. Because I don't want to be stuck in a rut. Mm. I may be. Mm. So I went into it very, very carefully, step mm. by step, mm. <laughs> and found, I, what does a rut mean to stick in a groove along a particular mm. line? Maybe. Mm. So I watch it. Mm. So observation of a fact is entirely different from the escaping or suppression of a fact. Mm. Mm -hmm. So he says you're stuck in a rut and you observe it, you don't compare. I don't. I don't know what. Am I in a rut? I look. Uh -huh. I'm stuck in a rut because I speak English. Uh -huh. I speak Italian and French. All right, that's not just. Am I psychologically, inwardly caught in a groove? Uh -huh. Like a tram car. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Just motivated by something and not understanding it. Yeah. No, Driven am I? By. I don't know. Yes. I'm going to find out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to watch. I'm going to be terribly attentive, sensitive, alert. Mm -hmm. Now this requires that you not react in the first place by saying, no, that's horrible, I couldn't I, possibly I be stuck in a rut. I wouldn't. Yeah. You may be telling the truth. Uh -huh. Well, but then to not have that reaction, excuse me. Sorry, go on. To not have that reaction, you can't have that self there that says, I'm not the type of person that's, that's stuck in ruts. I don't know. I... Sir, is there a learning mm -hmm. about oneself mm -hmm. which is not, uh, this leads to something else, I mustn't go into it, which is not constant accumulation of, about myself. I don't know if I'm making myself clear. Yes. You're saying that... that is, yeah, I observe yeah. myself. And I've learned about, from that observation, something. Mm -hmm. And I, that something is being accumulated to all the time mm -hmm. by watching. I think that's, that's not learning about yourself. Yeah, it's being concerned with what you think about yourself. Yeah, what you think about yourself, well, how, what, what you have gathered about yourself. Yeah. yeah it's like a river that's flowing. You have to follow it. Uh-huh. I mean, at least somewhere else. Let's get but, back to Well, no, maybe this is part of the question we're asking, because we start with 
how does this uh, disorder occur? And yes, sir, you let's say stick to that. it occurs because I have the image of myself as someone who knows he's not stuck in a rut. I don't like to think that I'm stuck in a rut. And somebody says, yes, you are. And, but you may be. Yes. Hmm. I have to be open to looking to see. Yeah, to observe. Uh -huh. But then what about this approach? I, somebody says I'm stuck in a rut. I look at myself and think, yes, I am stuck in a rut. And then I can respond by saying, well, what's wrong with that? No, Everyone's stuck that in a rut. you're just blind. No, you accept the fact, but then you uh, think, well, why should I do anything about it? Oh, well, what's wrong with that as an approach? Uh, like a man stuck uh, as a Hindu. Huh? Mm. He's stuck. He's then contributing to war. Well, I may say, well, I'm stuck in a rut, but so is everybody. It's the nature of humanity to be stuck I'm, in ruts. <laughs> you, you see, that's it. You go off, that's the nature of humanity. Yes. But I question that. I would if say everyone else right, is stuck in ruts. If you say that's the nature of humanity, hmm. let's change it for God's sake. But you may believe it's unchangeable. You see, what reason have I for believing that we can change it? I may think that I'm stuck in a rut, so are you, and so is everybody else. And anyone who thinks they're not is deceiving themselves. Is cheating themselves. Yes. I may cheat, so I begin to inquire, am I cheating myself? Mm. I want to be very honest about it. Mm. I don't want to cheat. I don't want to be a hypocrite. But you may not be a hypocrite. You may think I am stuck in a rut. And you may be a pessimist. You see, the alternative <laughs> to being a hypocrite is a pessimist, or no, one no, alternative. No, I'm neither a pessimist nor an optimist. I say, look, <laughs> am I stuck in a rut? Mm. I, wa I watch all day. And you perhaps conclude, yes. But then you can take the hypocrite, the pessimistic course and say, yes, I am, but say so what? Oh, yes, it's an, if, you do, if you prefer that way of living, go ahead. But I don't want to live that way. Well, the person who comes into therapy usually comes with both sides going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. He says that, uh, I have this problem which I want to be free of. I don't want to be stuck in a rut. On the other hand, when it gets down to really looking at that, he doesn't want to look at it either because it becomes uncomfortable. Oh, of course. Yeah. So, to come back to our original question, the world is in disorder. Yes. Human beings are disorder. And we describe what is disorder. And is there a possibility to live free from disorder? That's a real basic question. Mm -hmm. We said as long as there is this divisive process of life, I am a Hindu, you are, a, you are an Arab, mm -hmm. I am a Buddhist, you are a Muslim, I am British, you are an Argentine. Mm -hmm and that's so on, there must be conflict, war. My son is going to be killed. For what? Mm -hmm. Or as long as I identify on a personal level with my job or with my family or so on, there will be pain. Of course. It's the same process. So, is it possible to have, without identification, responsibility? If I'm not identified, will I even go to work? Yeah. But I'm responsible for, for the lady whom I've married. Mm -hmm. Responsible in the sense that I have to look after her, care for her, for whom she has to care for her. You see, responsibility means order. Mm -hmm. But we have become totally irresponsible but by we handled... isolating ourselves, British. Follow? We handle the problem of responsibility by developing a rut that we can work in. Yes, that's it. And staying inside yeah. there. If I recognize, it gives, oh. see the fact that responsibility is order, mm -hmm. I'm responsible to keep this house clean. And you are, but we, as we all live in this house, it's our earth, not the British earth and French earth and German earth. It's our earth mm -hmm. to live on. And we have divided ourselves. Mm -hmm. 
because in this division we think there's security. Mm -hmm. There's stability and security. Security, which is which is no security at all. Well, it isn't clear. We got to go slow because. I think that my job is security. I think mm. that my you may family is security. It. You may lose it. Mm -hmm. I, that problem keeps well, coming they, up. Uh, unemployment in America and in India. Mm -hmm. Three million people unemployed in India. Well, maybe I could get by without my job, but I need to think that I have some self-respect. I need to... What do you mean self-respect? Well, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that there's some place at which I put an identification why should I want to identify with anything, sir, that makes immediate isolation? Mm -hmm. <coughs> For stability's sake. Is isolation, does isolation bring about stability? It gives one a Temporary. sense of something hard and firm. Yeah. Does it? Has it? We have had, in the last five years, 5,000 years, 5,000, nearly 5,000 war. Mm -hmm. Is that s stability? No. Why don't we accept them? Well, I won't go into all that. What's wrong with us? Well, why don't we see this then? <coughs> You're saying that, that the root of the problem is that I continue to identify with one thing after another. If one doesn't work, I just find something else. I don't stop identifying. Yes, sir. That, which, which breeds isolation. Mm -hmm. But in your example about the person uh, that's stuck in a rut, you say, I don't have to identify. I can just step back and look at this thing and yes. see if it's true. Yes. So you're suggesting that there is something that is not identified, something that's free to look. No, uh, this leads to something else. Why do I want to identify myself? Probably, basically, the desire to be secure, mm -hmm. to be safe, to be protected, to, mm -hmm. and that sense of gives me strength. Mm -hmm. Strength and purpose, mm. direction. Mm. It gives me strength. Yeah. But this is a biological fact, yes, and sir, it's not merely an illusion. And if we again to come back to the animal kingdom, we see it there. Deer go round in flocks. Birds have flocks. Bees have hives, and they're identified with the hive in which they work. But the and bees don't kill themselves. The species don't kill themselves. Well, they kill each other. They kill other bees that invade ah, their but hive. They, but they don't commit suicide. <coughs> they kill other ones. But we are. Well, yes and no. I mean, bees do fight other bees. Of course, that come I into know the that. Hive. I raise bees. I know. Um, so. There, there is, we see even in the animal kingdom, this identification with the group in the social animals. Yes, there are many social just animals. Just a minute. And we're social. I agree, I agree. Mm. Are we, by identifying ourselves with India or China or Germany, <coughs> is that giving us security? To a limited extent, limited. it is. And <coughs> by identifying ourselves with our families, does. because. It, this whole question of responsibility seems closely linked to it. If I identify myself with my family, feel duties and so on towards them, protect if my sister's insulted, I rush to her defence and make a big fuss about it and <laughs> threaten, if not actually kill, the people we who insulted her. We can probably have no own. sisters. Yes, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> if I protect members of my family, and defend them, rush to their defence, say an insult to them or an attack to them is an insult to me. Of so course. I rush to their defence. There's a reciprocal, reciprocal obligation on them. If I fall ill or sick, they'll feed me and look after me. If I get arrested by the police, they'll try and get of me course, out of prison of and so on. So it does give me a kind of security. It of actually course it works. Does. Of course. And that's a very good reason for doing it for most but people. But stretch it further. Mm from the family to the community, community to the nation, and so on and so on. Mm. That's a vast process of isolating. Mm. You are English, I'm German, and we are at each other's throat. Mm. And I said, for God's sake, this is so damn stupid. 
Well, it's not entirely stupid because it works to a certain it extent. It's most impractical. It may work, but it's impractical. It's killing each other. Well, we haven't killed each other yet. There are more human beings than there ever have been before. So the system so far has gone on to the point where, far from killing each other, we've actually got to the point where we've got a bigger population than the world's ever seen in this I whole past. So the system works only too well for some reason. So I, you propose war to kill all? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but there's some aspect of it that does work and some security that's genuine that these things confer. Yes, sir. Certain, at certain level, identification has certain importance, right? Mm. But at a higher level, if you can call it higher, mm. it becomes dangerous. Mm. That's all we're saying. Of course, mm. I, I'm sure my brother will look out to me. Mm. Mm. It's but, very hard to... Uh, Draw the line. You see, uh, that that starts spreading out. That, that's right, spreading uh, out. Uh, you know, it slips. That's what I'm seeing, objective. But you see, the question is, where do you draw the line? Because if you're my brother, then you have the tribe or the clan or in India the caste. That's it. Yeah, you that's have your it. friends. So extend it, extend it. And then we say, I am mm. Argentine. You are British. He's mm. French, mm. and we are at it economically, socially, uh, culturally. We're murdering each other. Mm. And I said, but that's so insane. But where do you draw the line? You see, if you say the nation state is wrong, then what's wrong with the tribe or the caste? Then you've got conflict between those. No, you've I got do, conflict between I families. I don't draw the line. I say I'm responsible as a human being for what is happening in the world. Because I'm a human. And so what is happening in the world is this terrible division. Mm. And I won't be a Hindu, I won't be a Catholic, Protestant, a Buddhist, nothing. Mm. If a hundred people or a thousand people like that would begin to do something. Mm. So you're saying that the problem comes up because I mistake my local security, I think that it rests in some local identification. Yes, sir. Which is isolation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in isolation, there is no security. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is no order. 